So I'm Tally, and I'm going to talk about structured data and data set and queries, but there'll be pit stops on associations and um, how to use them to do interesting things in Mathematica. So um, we've all known that Mathematica can be a great platform for doing data science and for doing kind of experimental analytics and prototyping things and doing great interactivity and visualizations. But one of the weak points until now has been that it's hard to deal with very large data sets in a way that is kind of ergonomic and friendly. Um, and there are kind of many reasons for that. Uh, one is that it's hard to sort of see what you're doing if there, there's too much on the screen and it can slow down your front end to have all that data kind of coming back at you. And another kind of point along those lines is if something goes wrong, it can be very hard to see what went wrong because of the kind of infinite evaluation semantics of the language. Uh, if things don't evaluate, they can kind of spew and go crazy and you end up with a lot of unevaluated code spread across a large data set that can be disastrous for getting things done and debugging what went wrong. So starting in version 10, there's a new uh, construct to make it easier to work with structured data and to help you reason about things and help you express powerful queries. And that construct is called dataset. Uh, it takes some inspiration from similar constructs in other languages, like R in R you have data frames, for example. But there's a very different philosophy behind them, which I'll talk about in, in a bit of detail. So here's an example of a data set. And it's kind of pretty simple to see what's going on here. There's a bunch of columns. Those columns are named. And we have rows that contain the data. Uh, so far, you know, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, but what's, what gets interesting is that you can express in a very concise syntax powerful queries against that uh, set of data. So this particular data set is uh, from passengers of the Titanic. You might have seen it in Etienne's talk yesterday about machine learning. It's kind of a typical machine learning data set. People try things out on and sort of demo things. Uh, so here you can see we're doing some, some little queries. So what this query here is asking how many of the age fields in those rows, how many of those are missing? And we can see that quite a few of those ages are missing. Um, or we can, uh, we can do a histogram of a particular field. So if we get all the ages of, of passengers on the Titanic, what, what does that look like? You can see most of them are 22, 23. We can do something a bit more involved so we can uh, count how many people fell into the different passenger classes. Uh, sure, actually, I'm going to take a quick break and set the resolution a bit lower because that works better. That might not help very much. I prefer to do that rather than zooming in because zooming can change the way things line break or whatever, but is that big enough? It's actually a bit too big. I want to zoom out again. So, <laughs> uh, so here we're saying um, in the Titanic data set, I want to find out how many passengers fall into first class, second class, third class, but also I want to do that on a per sex basis, so for, for men and for women. And that's, again, it's quite concise to do that. And the last point, which touches on what I mentioned earlier, is that instead of kind of like going haywire, if something doesn't make sense, if you write a query that's sort of inapplicable, then we will give you a nice symbolic failure that you can use to, to try to rewrite your query in a way that makes sense. So here I'm asking for a column that just does not exist in the data set. And it just tells me right away that it can't do that. And it gives me a hint about what, what I could change so I could change that column to age or sex or, or survived, because those are the columns that are available. So before we go into more depth, um, I should talk about lists and associations, because that's a kind of like fundamental building blocks that you use to model data with data set in the Wolfram language. So you know everyone knows lists. They're kind of foundational, and we've had them since the beginning. Um, it's important to point out that lists serve the sort of dual purpose. On one hand, they can contain an arbitrary number of elements and you kind of use that to represent 
the same thing again and again and again, like all the ages, all the sexes. Uh, another point is that you can also use them in a sort of fixed way where the length might be the same, so length two in this case. And the first part means something different from the second part. It's not like they're interchangeable. Bob and Sue are inter interchangeable. Jane and Five are not interchangeable. So that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. We'll see examples of that later. Um, and now asso associations, the, the new and ten, they're used to, to represent um, records or associative arrays, things where you have parts that you want to index by an expression. So you want to talk about sort of age or sex, not just part one, part two. And you can see, uh, again, you can see two examples um, that sort of mirror what, I, what happened with lists. You can have associations where it's the same basic pattern repeated again and again. And here we're mapping names to ages, for example. And you can see the other case, which is a fixed association that has fixed fields, name, age, sex. You can't add another sex there. It changes the meaning. The value male is different from the value 30. So it's that same kind of distinction between two uses of the same data structure. So this is why I didn't want to zoom in, because that data set there is very small. That's what happens when you mess with, with formatting. Sorry about that. Uh, but with data set, the point is that you can nest these things infinitely to express all different kinds of, of shape of data structure. So in a typical case, you'll have lists of associations which represent tables, but anything is possible. And I'll give examples of those. Um, anyway, the point is, um, yeah, so I've covered list associations, but I want to go in a bit more detail into how associations work and the functions that operate on them, because that, again, those are like really important for actually getting stuff done. Um, the number one operation, obviously, is to look up values corresponding to specific keys. And there are many ways of doing that. The simplest way is to just use association as if it were a function. So I've defined an association here that has keys A, B, and C, and I'm looking up key A by just applying the association to A. But I can also use part syntax. So here I'm saying part, normally I would say like one or two or all, but in the case of an association, in general you have to use this wrapper key to kind of indicate that that A there is to be interpreted as the key of the, of the association. You can also use a function called lookup. And so lookup takes an association and a key and looks it up. What's cool about lookup is that it kind of threads in all these different ways. So you can provide a list of keys um, and you'll get back a list of the corresponding values. Or you can provide a list of associations and you'll get back, again, a list of values. And if you do both, you'll get back a kind of matrix where the rows are each of the associations and the columns are each of the keys. And the last cool thing about lookup is it gives you an opportunity to define a default value. If a, if a key is not found, instead of getting back missing, which is the, the, the normal default, the default default, you can define your own default. So I, I might want to know uh, something that, you know, if it's numeric, maybe zero is a reasonable default for some later step in my, in my algorithm. So another really common operation is counting things. And associations are great for that because the thing that you're counting is kind of naturally wants to be a key. And the count naturally wants to be a value. That means you can then look up how many times did A occur, how many times did B occur. The counts function does that. So we've got a, a list of, of items, then we get back uh, a list of, of counts. A occurred five times, B occurred two, twice. You can use counts by to kind of like parameterize your count based on the output of that function. So here I want to know that, you know, of those 20 numbers between 1 and 20, uh, 12 of them were not prime and 8 of them were prime. Group by gives you a way to group elements in a list into different, uh, different groups. Each group will be the value of a key. So in this case, prime q, you know, there are two possible outputs of prime q, true and false. And we can see those things that fell into the class false and the things that fell into the class two. Now, I'm showing you a little bit of syntax here that's, again, that's new in 10. And that's forward slash star. That's something called write composition. And that makes it really easy to chain together multiple functions to make one kind of compound function. And right here, in this case, it means I'm going to take the divisors of each integer. And I'm going to count how many divisors there are with length. And then the combination of those things just gives you, you know, how many divisors an integer has. So one has one divisor, two has uh, two, three, and five, and seven have two divisors because they're prime, et cetera. Uh, you can also do this thing. You can, pr uh, you can provide an operation to apply after you've grouped the elements. So you can say, 
You know, I want to group these things by their first element, so that's the first there. But after I've done that, I only care about the second element. And so I'm going to use last to kind of like post-process each of those, those elements in the group. You can nest groups, so you can keep grouping on different predicates at each step. Here we're first gathering things based on whether they're prime, and then we're uh, separating them into those that are less than 10 and those that are greater than 10. So those are the primes, and then here's whether they're less than or greater than 10. And the last kind of very powerful addition to this mixture is that you can give a reducer. And a reducer is then used to kind of collect together all the different results and, and summarize them in some way. So here we are grouping things that aren't in our prime between 1 and 20, and then we're sort of totaling them up so you can see the total of things that are, pr are prime were 77 and the ones that weren't prime were 133. And you can, you can actually use that to define a counts by if you want. So how do you combine associations? Well, there are different ways of doing it, depending on what kind of behavior you want. So if you just want to sort of mash them together and have the keys fight it out, if they're duplicate <coughs> keys, you can use associate, association itself as the combiner. So if I just put an association inside another association, or put multiple associations inside another association, they kind of glue themselves together to make one big association. And the semantics are that the rightmost uh, value wins. If there are multiple keys, the rightmost one will be the one that gets used. So here I have two associations that share the key C, but the second one has four for the value, the first one has three. Four is the one that won. You can use the merge function to collect things together and then decide what to do with them yourself. So we saw that C was the one that was in common, and so both values, I think I need to reevaluate that, yeah. Both values show up there. There's three and four there, and I can do different things. I could only take the three by using first. I could use something like total to kind of add them up. It's up to you how you want to how you want to uh, kind of reconcile these different associations. Now there's like a lot more that I'm not showing you, but this is meant to be fast. Um, so there's lots of functions for dealing with keys that I won't go into. The one that's kind of particularly relevant for dealing with data sets is key union. And what that does is fill in any keys that are missing across a list of keys. So if you have sort of sparse data, not all the keys are present, then you can fill in the keys that aren't there by using key union. It detects what keys it should add. There's an, a kind of dual of that, which is key intersection, that finds the keys that are actually are in common between all of them, and it drops all the other keys. Now, you can do stuff that's kind of equivalent to operations in SQL. I won't go too much into that, because it's like it's actually a different track from the track that dataset takes. But if you do need that functionality, it's there in the form of join across, which you can read all about in the documentation. So I'm actually going to do something here. I don't like the fact that this formatting is, is different in style sheet mode. I'm going to go back to working mode, uh, and it should look like how I originally designed it. Yeah, it looks better. Cool. There's a, another little thing we need to get through before we should kind of launch into a data set, and that's the notion of an operator form. So these are, again, new in 10, kind of inspired by what we needed for data set to be concise and elegant. And the way to think about them is that if you're familiar with currying in other languages, this is our take on currying. So there's a kind of list of many dozens of functions in Mathematica that existed before, but now have an operator form. And I'll give an example of an operator form quickly. Let's look up uh, something like map. That's too small. I should probably zoom in there. So you know everyone's familiar with map. It's a workhorse function. But now map has this operator form. And the idea with an operator form is it's, it's the operation without having been applied. It kind of symbolically represents the act of mapping a function over something, over an expression. And it acts like a function. So once you've got this operator form, you then just apply it, and it'll evaluate like an ordinary map would if you'd written two arguments. So let's go back. OK. So to kind of justify why we want that, I want to take you a little detour through sort of the different style of code that it, that it unlocks that you can write now with operator forms. So this is just a very kind of simple example. 
we're taking the text in Alice in Wonderland and we want to count, find the most frequent words. So we want to remove words that like are boring, words like the and, and, and and a and so on. Uh, we can get that from word data. And now we're going to use this kind of nested set of uh, function calls to find those most common functions, uh, those most common words, and sort them in order of their appearance and take the top 10. Now that's fine, and if you're sort of familiar with you know, the style of, of coding, it's probably not too hard to figure out what's going on there. But I think it can be better, and operator forms sort of give you a way of making that happen. So the way to read this, of course, is inside out, because that's how it evaluates. First, you find the innermost thing, string split. That evaluates into a list of words. Two lowercase, lowercase is all the words. Delete cases removes the trivial words, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, it's a bit weird, because that's not how you naturally want to read things. You can't really easily find the inside to, to, to kind of read it inside out. If you want to change things, then editing a bracket like immediately destroys the syntax correctness of that piece of code. And then you have to kind of like find the matching bracket now that it's gone to take it out to do something else like that. So if you want to rearrange the order of things, if you want to edit or delete things, it can be very hard to deal with these nested expressions. They're sort of unfriendly and not very ergonomic. You have some tools at your disposal to make it easier. You can use you know, prefix or postfix forms like at and forward slash forward slash. Um, but that only gets you so far. But with operator forms, you can boil down the sequence of operations into a beautiful pipeline that reads from left to right in a very English-like way. So here's the abstract operation we're doing. First, we're splitting up the string into words. We're lowercasing those words. We're deleting the trivial words. We're counting them. Then we're sorting the results. Then we're reversing that sorted thing, because it's in the wrong order. And lastly, we're taking 10 elements. Now, that's really nice and readable. And the only nesting I had to use was for take. That's because take does not support an operator form. It's a varargs function, although we don't usually use that fact. Because it's varargs, we don't know that take 10 on its own could be an operator form. Take 10 is valid. It just means don't do anything. What did you, I'm sorry, what did you say, varargs? Varargs means it can have a variable number of arguments. So an example would be. You can keep writing things here, technically, but it's very few people actually use that. Now, there's the stuff that this unlocks. I mean, for one thing, what I've written here is a valid function. So we don't even need to define a function with a down value. We can just set that to a symbol, and we have a, a valid function we can use. We can also do thing, interesting things like return new functions. So we can have functions that return functions. That's certainly possible to do at the moment. But it, it gets more idiomatic when you have these very clean symbolic representations of compound operations. And the last thing is a bit more of an abstract point. It's that it's harder to, if you want to think about processing a function in the abstract, if you want to think about a chain of operations, maybe you want to optimize those operations, find a different order that does the same thing but that executes faster. It's hard to do that against pure functions. If pure functions is the way that you've represented these comp this compound operator, then you have to sort of pattern match inside pure functions, look inside them, and it's sort of inelegant. And in some cases, it's impossible to know exactly what a pure function will do. Well, the fact that a pure function is the same as another one, the variables might be d different, slots might be named differently. So it's kind of it's cleaner to have a symbolic representation of operations that you can pattern match on, you can process in a clean symbolic way. So as a kind of little sort of hint at what we're working on, if you want to start rewriting these these operations into something like SQL, it's just quite natural to do that if you have operator forms. If you have big messy pure functions, it's sort of a lost cause. OK, so we have the ingredients we need to look at some uh, practical data sets. Uh, the one I've already mentioned, the Titanic data set. The thing to understand about it is that any kind of data can fit in a data set. If it's structured, if it's kind of has the same consistent in, in the way that it's structured, then it, it'll work. Um, but there's certain kinds of, of, of certain shapes of data that have special meaning to data set in that they format in a kind of a familiar way. So here we have, I don't know if everyone can see that. I can make that image bigger if I need to. Here we have this familiar table. Underneath, it's stored as lists of associations. 
Now that should feel natural, right? It even prints in a way that's kind of reminiscent of a table. Each particular association is an observation. Sorry, go ahead. When it prints this little summary table on the left here, is there any way to expand that to see more of it, you know, to, other than the first few entries there? Or? That's a feature that's coming. I mean, in this particular example, there are no missing elements. Like, that's the entirety of it. But for bigger data sets, it does elide rows. You can't see all of them at the moment. But that'll get better in the future. The key point is that each association has an observation. So you, that it's natural to have a row be an association, because a row is the unit of analysis that you typically want to use. You can select. You can map over these things. Um, you know. That's, it's the right thing. It's kind of logical for to model your data as lists of associations if, if this is what it is. Now, a little variation on that is an association of associations. So here we have, you'll notice what's different about this is there's this, this new column on the left. And that column contains keys. And that's kind of why it's darker. It's because just like before, the, the, the headers indicated keys. Now the, the rows, the leftmost column indicates that we have keys here. And that's because the corresponding data is an association of associations. And the keys in the outer association are the names of these rows, the kind of named rows. And then again, it's the same story inside. The keys inside each association correspond to columns. So here's, it's like conceptually, you've just labeled each observation. That's all that's happening. And what's nice about that, of course, is it lets you easily look up individual observations or if you select them out, you can tell which ones you, you got, that kind of thing. Uh, here's a little bit more of a complicated one. Um, it's actually simpler in some sense. Um, there are no associations to be found at all. Here we just have lists of lists. And the first element of each list is the first column and so on. That's how it maps out onto the data set. That's common if you're doing something very lightweight and you don't want to bother naming things. So how do you construct data sets? I've shown you how they format, but how do you construct them and how do you get them into the system? Well, the first way is just manually in the language itself. So here I'm making a list of associations, and they all have the same keys. They have n, square, prime, and so on. And if I wrap that in data set, then that list of associations gets turned into a data set object that <coughs> stores that same data, but now it will format it for me, and it will let me write queries on it. You can also import files into data sets using uh, functions like semantic import. So what semantic import does is looks at a, f a file, a TSV or CSV file that you have, um, and tries to figure out what the columns are, tries to figure out if certain columns have a specific interesting semantic type, something like country, for example. We'll use some of the sort of natural language understanding technology that we have in alpha sort of sh uh, ship that to you in the form of semantic import. You can locally at high speed parse these interesting things, things like uh, uh, countries, dates, times, um, cities, uh, even famous people. And they will turn into these rich entity objects in the language inside a data set. So text and then data set in which we've, we know what these countries are. And you can then use all the power of the Wolfram knowledge base to to do computations with them. And the last way of getting things in um, is from Alpha itself, from the knowledge base. If you use the entity value function, uh, you can ask for the results to come back in the form of a data set. So here I'm looking up a list of entities and a list of properties, countries in Europe, GDP population, country code, and I'm getting them back formatted as an index table <coughs> data set. So to discuss queries, uh, I want to kind of lead you through how we got to them. Um, queries are these, I've alluded to them. They're concise ways of, of doing interesting computations on data sets. But they build off on something that's already in, ma in Mathematica and Wolfram language that everyone's familiar with, and that's uh, part syntax. So part syntax is a very flexible thing. Um, part syntax is based on the, w on the fact that the full form of any expression is kind of uniquely addressable. You can talk about the third part of a list uh, and But more importantly, you can nest these part specifications. So if I say part of expression P1, P2, P3, 
then each of those p's is talking about a part within a level of a hierarchical expression. And in the world of associations that just carries over very simply, instead of using integer parts, you can use string keys. And those allow you to talk about the value corresponding to a certain key in a hierarchical expression. So let's do some simple examples. Um, we've got uh, the function tally. Tally takes a list of elements and gives you back lists of pairs of each element and its count. Um, this is really basic stuff, but, but it'll, we'll, we'll keep going. You can take the first such pair, the second. You can take from all the pairs the first element, from all the pairs the second element. You can see how that kind of multi-level multi uh, specification is very powerful. I mean, just obviously immediately it's very powerful. Now, when you bring associations into the mix, uh, it gets more interesting. So I'm, I'm starting with a kind of column-oriented table. So we have an association whose values are lists. And if I transpose that association, I will get a list whose values are associations. So it's just an easier way to write it for this example, but it's also, it might be interesting to see that you can do that. Uh, this should happen without an option. So for now, we're being cautious. We have this option you need to use, but we might change the semantics of that so that you don't need an option to do that. Um, now that I have this table, lists of associations, I can look up the age of the first association. I can look up all the ages. I can look up both age and sex. And when you do this, when you provide a list of parts, you get back a sub-association. So we preserve the fact that there's an association there, and we drop whatever keys you didn't mention in that list. Now, the core idea of queries is that we just take the, those recursive semantics, the hierarchical semantics of, of part, and we extend them to work with not just parts, but with any number of operations, like any operations you, you, you want. Selecting things, sorting things, uh, taking uh, um, summaries of things with things like total and mean. All those functions now have a meaning in the context of a sort of part specification. Uh, and that's what a uh, query does. So some very simple examples. I'm not going to show you the output because I'll show you later. Some very simple examples of what a query looks like on a data set. Titanic's a data set. And I use sort of function application syntax. I give this, what I've written here, is a part specification. Like all age, that would work on a list of associations without any data set involved at all. But I can change that all to a select operator form. There's the select operator form. This is saying I want to take only those rows for which age is greater than 30. And for those rows, I want to then take the survived key value. And that's the kind of, that's all it is, really. It's just extending part syntax with function application. So let's take a look at uh, more detail uh, at how this works. Um, the way to understand it is that each subsequent specification in your query corresponds to a deeper level of the data set. So at level one, we have the list itself, the outermost list of these associations. At level two, we have each association. And at level three, we have the values in each association. So when I write a query like all comma age, all, because it's the first thing, corresponds to the outermost level. So we want everything from that list. But what are we going to do to each thing in the list? Well, we're going to take age. So again, age is now referring to each association. So we can look up in each association age. And that's, that's why we get those, those values. But we could go further. We could apply something to the age itself. Once we've got each age, we could apply something further. So now we're going to round each age to the nearest you know, 10. And that's the result we see. So a different kind of query. We might select the rows. So we don't want to take all the rows now. We want to just select those rows that have some property and from those rows, we will take, from each association, we will take the age. And so that's the kind of general shape of how things work. I'll now kind of run into some examples. These are in the documentation, so you can look them up anytime you want. They're good examples, though, which is why I'm copying them. Again, we start with the Titanic data set. Uh, we can just ask for the length. So Titanic is a list of associations. It's nothing wrong with asking for the length of a list. We'll see that there are 1,309 people. We can sample those so we can get you know, five random passengers. That's, again, a data set. 
If we want to see the data behind the data set or inside the data set, we can use normal to get that. And again, you see it's just lists of associations. We can count the number of associations that have the value missing for age. We can count the number of passengers in each class. We can get a histogram of the ages. Uh, this is more interesting. So we're now taking, again, a histogram of the ages. I'm going to customize what that histogram does. So I want to use bins of size 4 between 0 and 80. But I want to do something else too. I want to parameterize the result by the passenger class. So if I just drop this, this is a development version, so this might break. I have no idea. Yeah, no, oh, that works. So if I just run it like this, I'm getting a histogram of all the ages. But if I add in a group by, I'm now getting a result that has an extra level of association. And that extra level of association tells me which passenger class is this histogram sort of conditioned on. And I could just, if I wanted to, I could keep adding. I could do another one for sex if that so took my fancy. You can see that that's the beginning of something quite, quite powerful. Um, the list goes on, but maybe I should kind of skip ahead here. Um, here's a different kind of, this is a more, there's more structure in this data set. It's kind of outside the realm of what you typically find in, in uh, you know, a spreadsheet or a CSV file. So here we have a, a planets data set. And you can tell from the, the gray column on the left that this is an association of associations. But there's something else going on, which is that one of the fields, the moon's field, has another table embedded in it. And it's hard to format that without making the whole table so big that you can't actually effectively read anything. But so we give you a kind of a lighted summary. Uh, we might show you the first couple of values, and then we show you a little dot, dot, dot to let you know that there's more stuff. But it's there, and you can then start getting that out. So let's look at the mass of the Earth. That's very simple. It's just the row Earth, the column mass, that's its value. But now we can look up one of those subtables. So what are the moons of Neptune? Well, there's the table. We can fully format it now because we don't have anything else, any other structure around this. But we can keep going. So let's get all the radiuses, the radii. Uh, let's make a bar chart of the radii. So now we have three things. We're finding the moons, getting for all the planets, take the moons, and then give me the number of moons, the length of moons, the length of that list. Can make a pie chart of that. So now here we're going to compute uh, a result and then use that result in another query. So I'm going to get out the mass of Earth's moon. And then once I have that, I'm going to select only those moons from other planets that are more than twice, that are more than half the, the mass of our moon. And then I'm doing something interesting here. I don't want to see all the extra information about those moons. I just want to see what they are. So I'm going to use keys there that will take that association of associations. Just give me the keys, just the names of those moons. So I can see, you know, Earth, obviously the moon is twice its half its mass, as more than half its mass. Uh, Jupiter, you know, a couple of heavy moons there, et cetera. The maximal operator by, which I haven't mentioned so far, lets you find the subset of a list or association um, that maximizes some uh, property or value. So here I'm asking for, of each of the sets of moons for all the planets, which of those moons are heaviest? And in our, you know, in our case, there's only one, so it's only the moon. It's Ganymede, Titan, Triton, et cetera. Okay. Um, I could go on, but maybe I should just keep going and, and try to get to a different topic. Uh, yeah. So in all of this, there's something kind of interesting going on behind the scenes that if you've worked with data sets, you might even have encountered this already. There's a kind of a, a distinction in when you write these queries, when you write kind of all these operators one after another, some of them, they fall into two classes. Some of them behave in a descending fashion, and some of them behave in an ascending fashion. And what that means is that when the result is being recursively computed, Sometimes you want to perform an operation before you recurse down, and other times you want to perform an operation after you've already recursed down and come back up again. That sounds very abstract, but I'll, I'll give a simple example to make it clear what the difference is. So we've got a very simple data set here. This is three columns, age, sex, and whether someone's employed. Um, let, look at the query max, comma, age. So we know what all comma, age does. Just gives me the list of the ages. 
If I do max comma age, it makes sense that I have to wait until I've got the list of ages before I can apply max. I can't apply max to the associations themselves because, you know, what's max of true and false? So I've got to take the ages, I've got to go further along the query, get the ages before I come back to the left, to the left, and then compute max on the results, on the sub results. But I can show another example of where the opposite had to happen. So here, I actually want to do the selection first. I want to select those rows, those people for which their age is greater than 20, before I look up their sex. I could do it afterwards, actually, but it's just more efficient to first get the rows I'm interested in and then do something to those rows, look at the, the sex field. So, how does this work? Well, the answer is that some operators don't make sense if you apply them before you do subsequent operators. So, I've already given an example, max. It does not make sense to take max uh, and then recurse into what you've got. It just doesn't make any sense. So, it turns out that it's sort of like natural, sort of all these different operators naturally cleave into those that make sense to do ascending versus those that make sense to do descending. And that's what we've done. So they kind of automatically work in a way that you, that they need to, to be, to be useful to you. Now some of them, you know, it might take a while to kind of get used to the semantics of, of ascending and descending, but once you do, it is, it is fairly natural. You can even do things like combine descending and ascending operators. And the descending part will be done before you take age, and then the ascending part will be done after you have got the age. OK, now it can still get tricky. And for the most part, data set will stop you shooting yourself in the foot. If you write an invalid query that just doesn't make sense, we'll, we won't even execute it. We'll give you feedback that what you wrote didn't make sense, and, and that'll help you to kind of figure things out for yourself. Uh, but in the future, we might provide all kinds of pred predictive interface mechanisms that kind of give you feedback as you write the query that autocomplete the things that you can do at a certain level of your, of your data set. And that should make it like really foolproof to, to write complicated queries. So I thought I've sort of described data set and given some examples of how it works. I could go into a little bit about what it's doing behind the scenes. Um, but also maybe now is a good time to answer any questions if anyone has any questions. Do you have a concept analogous to multiple key records? I've been thinking about that a little bit. Um, I think it might make sense to have a structure called multi-association. Um, and the, I think the strongest case for it is where there's no natural nesting order. Like a good example would sort of be census uh, sort of data. You know, like it, it doesn't matter which way you split things up. Uh, all the different dimensions, in some sense, sort of commute through each other. And it, yes, it might make sense to have. And then the promise we would make is that you can look up on any of those keys, um, and it would be equally efficient no matter which key you pick. Um, the thing we would we do, I don't think we want to go as far as mimicking SQL. Like I don't think like each of those things should be unique. I think that's a, a restriction that we would want to enforce. So whenever you use anything that's like not whitelisted, in other words, explicitly known to be descend, because descending operators have this very special property that after they've done something, it still makes sense to recurse into the result, like select. It doesn't change the shape of, of, what, it, of what its input was. It might make it smaller, but the shape is the same. That's why it makes sense for selected to be descending. But if you write your own operator that you think should be descending, there are a kind of, not hacky, but opaque ways to make it artificially descending. And I can, I can show you those. But maybe we should add a head called descending that lets you kind of explicitly call out what you want to do. Yeah. Would you comment on how data sets are combined? <coughs> so I think that's a weak point at the moment, honestly. I mean, uh, with, you know, in the relational world, it's kind of very, very natural to combine things. We do provide join across, but Join across is kind of almost like a sort of poor cousin of the rest of the functions there. It's, it does do to the letter what SQL does in these situations. 
But what makes things more complicated for us is that not only do you have sort of lists of associations, you might also have associations of associations. What's the natural way to join there? Like there's, that's something where there's one primary key. You know, like we want to unlock sort of very natural semantics for how to combine different data sets, and especially how to combine data sets deeper than at the top level. So if you have, you know, one data set and you like deep inside, it's referring to another data set. It's, it's using a value that turns out to be the primary key for some other data set. It should be really natural to kind of chain in and to keep working. And I haven't quite figured out the semantics of how that should work. But if you have suggestions, I would, if anyone has suggestions, I'd, I'd love to hear them. For the ne next talk, really, is we have some news about uh, what in functions you have to that kind of operations. So uh, 10.0.2 is very close. It's not much time left. Um, there's some stuff at the end that, that you might be interested in. So keep, uh, stick around. So yeah. Could you go back to the people data set case? And <coughs> yeah, that, when you do that query, just go back down a little bit. We have the set and then the um, that's it there. Now, if you remove the um, right composition max and just do a. Just do what? Just So suppose you just have the select comma a. Um, and then you have all max, it will give the same result. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's totally right, yeah. So the way to... Is it possible to do age, comma, max all within the one? Age, comma, max. So you first get select on the age. Yeah. And then can you have comma, max? Does that work? Well, it doesn't work. No, because there's, no, there's no level there. Like these are talking specifically about levels in the original data set. I mean, you... you this is a really good point. You I mean, brought this up because what we're really doing here, I mean, the way to think about, the way I like to think, which is maybe a little bit technical, but the way I like to think about what a data set query is doing is, is the little, like, machine that's sort of eating away at the data set and sort of recursing out and making copies of itself at each level. Um, and by ending a query and starting a new query, you reset that machine to start again at the top. Instead of trying to force it to do exactly what you want within one query. And that can be clearer to sort of stop, have an intermediary result, and then process that intermediary result again, like with like what we're doing here. Yes. So it's slower. And it, it just intrinsically cannot ever be as fast because the, the evaluation semantics are clear. Like this thing evaluates before this has a chance to do anything. So we can't optimize anything there. There might be a solution to that, though. Cryptic. Um, OK, so sorry, one more question. Yeah. Uh, association is very big, so big like a value, the exact value comes to each uh, every thousand in the field of the object. I mean, uh, up values as a, as a kind of way of implementing associative arrays. I mean, you're right, yeah. Uh, associations are less flexible in that sense that you can't use them to define functions with patterns. But what I would say is that up values were such a kind of grotesque way of achieving associative array behavior in the language because they were so, they're kind of global, they're stateful, they're not immutable, they don't have any of the properties that you want in a functional language. Whereas associations have all of those properties. You know, they encapsulate all their state into just the expression itself. and. You know, you can, if you append to it, you'll get another association, and the old one's still there. And those, those properties are really important. Yeah. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, like, you, lose in a way and you, win. You, you win in a big way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So don't have much time, so I want to rush through this. Um, so I mentioned that operator forms are this, like, what's really nice about them, they're symbolic. You can look at them, you can pattern match on them. They represent, they don't just behave a certain way, they represent that behavior in a robust, stable way. And it turns out that queries just compose operator forms. That's all that they do. When you have this kind of, this hierarchical query, it just boils down into a bunch of nested operator forms. I think it's a really clean and elegant um, fact. Uh, so we can take a look at some examples. Um, you've seen all of these so far, right? You've seen map and select and, and all these operator forms. There's one that you haven't seen that's slice. The way to express that is slice is the operator form of part. Part's varag, so we can't make an operator form for it. But if we could, it would be 
slice. It's like you will see slice come up. It's not a system symbol. It's in some context. But I'm hoping to find a way to, to make it a system symbol, to find some, something we can all agree would be good to have in the core language. So um, I will make some statements, and then I will show you the sort of general result. So here are some particular equivalences. So the query all comma f is equivalent to the operator form map f. And to make it clear, here are two of them doing the same thing, giving the same result. So I'm preserving everything at the top level, and at the inner level, I'm applying f. And of course, that's the same as map f. How could it not be? Now I've got selective f, so I'm selecting things according to some predicate. And then I'm doing g to each of those things. That's, again, that's equivalent to select f composed with map g. So first I'm selecting things, and then afterwards I am mapping g across what remains. And there's just to prove it's the same thing. All comma key is equivalent to slice all comma key. So again, slice is just part. So obviously that's a part syntax, so of course it's the same. Now, it turns out that you know, once you figure out ascending, descending, and you have lists of which things are descending, it's very easy to compile any query into one of these compound forms. So in version 10.02, this is explicit. Like you can get out what the, the compiled form is if you want to see it. And here are some examples. So all f, that's the compiled form. These are just, I'm just repeating what you saw earlier. Um, and here's a slightly more exa uh, complex example. I'm selecting something. I'll get out a list of things, and then from each thing, I still want to take a key. What's really nice about these is that you have the potential to optimize these guys. Once you've got out these sort of compound operators that sum up what you're going to do, you can then start applying identities and figuring out the best way to, to execute that, that query. Um, I don't have time, so I won't go into the types. There's actually a huge amount here, probably half an hour's worth of material to talk about. So underneath data set, in order to help you uh, not write invalid queries and to format the data set in a sort of an intelligent way, and in future to start doing things like compiling the queries down into sort of machine code or sort of uh, other, other things like the Wolfram uh, virtual machine, in order to do that, we need to know what the shape of the data set is. And that's being modeled behind the scenes. And I'll briefly show you. If we look at the Titanic data set, I'm just going to random sample it so we can see it's not going to be too big. If I take input form of this, then I can see that the first argument is the data. There's all the data. And then the second argument is a type description of that structure. So this is a compound type, obviously. It's a vector of structs. And then there's more information about individual columns, the atoms of, of uh, some of them are integers, some of them are strings, booleans, and so on. Um, and you can do really interesting things with these types. That's a whole other talk that maybe I should give at some point about the, uh, the usefulness of, of, of such a type system for the rest of the language as well. It doesn't impose anything on you. you don't, you're not forced to do anything. You don't even know that it's there, actually. But it does have the smarts to stop you writing invalid queries and to help format things and to optimize things. Um, the general thing that this is a form of is known as an algebraic data type system. I would love to show you more, but that's like the, you know, there's no, I have three minutes left, so it's going to have to wait. I want to talk a little bit about what's coming up. Um, so it's clear that there's a sort of zoo of different list association related functions that need to exist to help you push and pull at the shape of a data set to get it exactly how you want. Um, so the most pressing one, I think, is to take uh, an unindexed table, just a list of associations, and turn it into an index table, an association of associations, and back again. Like it's such a simple operation, and it's frustratingly difficult to do it by hand. That needs to be a function. Hopefully, we can get that for 10.03. But there are many other and other things that we should do. And I th and I think one of them was mentioned by one of the gentlemen there about um, you know making it easy to kind of to join into another another data set from from part of a query. And then there are these operator forms that have kind of come up in the process of, of building data set that are clearly useful. So one is slice. Another one is apply through, which I could briefly show you um, that looks something like this. 
um, it's, it's like fan out, you know? It takes a bunch of functions and it applies them in parallel to an argument. Not literally in parallel, just conceptually in parallel. There's a lot of room for optimization. So if our focus for this first release was just to get the semantics right and to make sure that you know, it had the power that, and flexibility that we thought it needed. But there uh, a, a remains a huge amount that's inefficient about data sets. I mean, the primary thing there is that data sets are built, the common case of, of tables with columns, those data sets are built as lists of associations, as I've drilled home by now. And those are, that's kind of antithetical to memory usage, to, to, to lean, efficient memory usage. Um, and the reason is that that association data structure is sort of quite unnecessary. Like, you know that they're all the same. You know that they all have the same keys. You don't need to store those keys again and again and again. Even if you're sharing pointers, the superstructure of the association is expensive. And the last reason is that you can't store the values packed. If you have a column of numbers, you know, we have packed arrays to make it efficient to store large lists of, of numbers. And we can't use any of that functionality because they spread out across all these associations. So the plan is really straightforward and should work quite nicely. That's to internally store them in column, sort of column-oriented way, and then naturally map any queries you write so that you don't notice that that's happening. <laughs> Just like we do with packed arrays, like you don't notice that packed arrays are there. They will naturally unpack themselves if you ever need, the, you know, if you use a function that isn't written to deal with them. The same will go with these column or tables. They will just naturally work. They'll be efficient in 99% of cases, and the odd thing that isn't written to take advantage of them will just see the right data underneath. Um, query planning, there's lots of optimization we can do there, and the most enticing thing is to is to is to hook into the Wolfram virtual machine and in future into a technology like LVM intermediary representation, but there's you know that's a very big topic. It's still hard to get data into data set like out of a database. It's kind of very finicky to sort of find the right way to denormalize a, a, a SQL database, relational database into a data set. Uh, we're working on ways to make that easy, and when it's easy, it should be quite seamless. Like you should be able to write queries that look like they're built against hierarchical data but are actually being executed by SQL behind the scenes and are streamed back into Mathematica. That'll be very exciting. We also have an out of memory, out of core kind of solution coming that should make it possible to deal with data sets that are far too big to fit in RAM, but still small enough that they can live on disk. And I have zero seconds left, so that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>